Welcome to the afternoon, the late afternoon session, our session on uh, public transit and active transportation. We're really happy to be bringing a uh, discussion on transit to, to the Oregon Active Transportation Conference. Um, and uh, happy to be see, see transit being talked, I think, more about this, uh, this year's conference than in the past. Um, so, I'm Aaron Antrim, and uh, if you hadn't guessed already, my role is to, just my small role here is to introduce the session and speakers. And this morning, uh, Mark Gordon prescribed transit as part of the cure for places that have been harmed by uh, car dominance. Um, and yet, I think the, the fundamental importance of transit is often overlooked. And I think, I think I can say that many active transportation advocates see it as less sexy than walkable downtowns, ciclovias, and bike tourism. Um, I hope we can convince you that transit is sexy, um, and, and moreover, convince you that transit is key um, for a lot of the goals we're trying to achieve. It spans distances between walkable places, um, and buses and trains are fountains of pedestrians. They enable uh, activity in walkable environments. And transit provides mobility to people who can't bike, uh, walk very far, or drive. And access for people who are priced out of newly desirable and walkable places. And so, um, our, our vision here as we talk about a multimodal network for Oregon is that uh, all residents and visitors will be able to access work, recreation, good services in their communities without a car. And that the multimodal transportation system will be useful tra for travelers whether they are car free or as a lifestyle choice of necessity. Uh, So our panelists up front here, uh, they're going to give a background and talk about Oregon's transit network, um, talk about how it's managed, uh, talk about building blocks, how bicycling, walking, and transit are integrated together, and how will this multimodal network be managed, planned, and measured. What are the benefits of this multimodal network? And what are the barriers to achieving these goals? We're going um, to we're going to see a series of five presentations. Uh, it'll take about forty-five minutes, and then hold all QA for the latter half of the session. Actually, I think it'll take about an hour. Um, so if you if questions come up, write them down, and we want to have that discussion in the later half. I'm going to introduce our speakers um, in the beginning so that we can flow naturally from one presentation to the next. Matthew Barnes is the uh, Rural General and Transportation Options Program Coordinator at the ODOT Public Transit Division. He's responsible for overseeing Oregon's intercity and rural transit programs. Evan Corey is a transportation planner with Nelson Nygaard. His expertise in access to transit strategies, cycle network design, Multimodal, multimodal corridor access and design, and integrating non-motorized transportation solutions into complex planning processes. And he is working on Vancouver, BC's TransLink's uh, regional cycling strategy and transportation <coughs> plan. Jeff Olin is with TriMet, and he, as their active transportation planner, he works integrating that into their various transit projects. Uh, Ross Peterson is a planner with Ride Connection. His expertise in maximizing mobility for non-drivers. And his work focuses on transportation options for people who cannot drive, including seniors, people with disabilities, and low-income individuals. And Robin Phillips with ODOT, uh, she rejoined the ODOT Public Transit Division in 2012 and serves as the Regional Transit Coordinator for Region 5 in La Grande, right? Yeah. Um, and she spent, she comes to us after spending the previous five years in DC 
working on policy initiatives and uh, previously worked for ODOT and Watchdog. So she has a long career in transportation. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's hear from our first speaker, Matthew. statewide fixed route transit network. For those of you that aren't transit geeks, uh, fixed route service is, is the service that's not like taxi service, but has regularly scheduled service and fixed stops. Um, we've taken some uh, steps in the last few years uh, to improve the usability of the transit network, and we've been focusing largely on visibility. I'm going to talk a little bit about leveraging those investments in visibility in ways that um, allow us to make the, the network more usable in other ways. There are currently uh, 40 to 50 fixed route transit services in the state. Um, these include services like uh, Greyhound and Porter Stage Lines, both for profit services. Uh, you've got public transit agencies like TriMet and RBTV. There's service out there that's contracted directly by ODOT to fill gaps in the, in the network. These are called the point services, if you've heard of those. There's passenger rail service, um, airport shuttles. So you've got lots of different kinds of fixed route service. Um, each one has a different ridership constituency and a different sense of what their place in the network is. Um, most of them see the value of the larger network, but depending on the organization, they may take larger or smaller steps towards being a part of that network. So we've got a, we've got a network that functions, uh, but it's not optimal. There's a fair amount of work to be done in terms of improving the network. The, uh, the network visibility piece that we've been focusing on the last few years um, is uh, really been an effort around getting uh, transit services into Google Transit. If you've played with Google Transit, it's a, a very nifty itinerary planner piece of software. Um, and one of the magic aspects of Google Transit is that it, it crosses transit agency boundaries. Um, this is unlike the, the trip planner that Greyhound provides or Amtrak. Um, and it's different than something like you see in a large urban area like in the TriMet house. Um, so, so the Google Transit allows you to, as a user, make trips across the network um, and makes the network much more usable. This map you see up here is a, a collection of the longer distance transit services in the state. It does not include a lot of the local service. Um, it gives you an idea of the network. If you look at the map, uh, there are a couple of obvious gaps in there. Uh, there's a Yahats to Florence gap that should really stand out there, and also uh, Baker City to its John Day area to the east of the city. So maps are useful for beginning to understand the network and, and looking for ways to, uh, or opportunities to close <coughs> gaps in cost-effective ways. As um, we've made this large investment in, um, in, the, in Google Transit and the network, and that's largely been a process of creating GTFS data um, that's the input to the, the transit trip planner. This, per this particular slide is leveraging that investment in uh, GTFS, and it's a I'm out of work. Okay, here's, here's the Greyhound trip planner. Just a, a screenshot of a trip using the Greyhound trip planner. Important thing to note about this is it's a mono agency, does not cross agency boundaries. Here's a screenshot of the Amtrak trip planner. 
Again, mono agency doesn't cross agency boundaries. If you're in the Amtrak world, you can't get to Greyhound and vice versa. So this is underscoring the value of the, the uh, Google Transit. Here's a, a, a screenshot of uh, Google Transit in the northeast portion of the state. Um, this underscores the work we've done over the last few years in, in creating this GTFS data to allow the system to work. So we have a really rural transit system. In the past, there's no way they can afford a trip planner for themselves, but with the existence of Google Transit, they've got this great functionality that this, their citizens can plan trips on. Um, this slide uh, shows a Another trip on Google Transit, I think that's, this has either four or five different services involved in this trip. Um, so it's, in, in terms of usability of the network, Google Transit is very cool stuff. Um, I wonder if anyone here has used the Google Transit smartphone application and their navigation function. Cool, some people have. It, this, is, this is a really awesome part of Google Transit. Um, if you're on a bus in a strange community, you planned your trip using this application, it'll tell you when to get off the bus. My experience is um, it really makes that whole travel by transit much more convenient, much easier, much safer. Um, in, in terms of network visibility, these three items are, are what's on the horizon for us. Starting to look at real-time information, um, multi-mode um, multi trip planning. So this is, if, if you used um, TriMet system, you can actually plan a combination bike and transit trip. That's the kind of functionality we'd like to see across the state. Um, and another goal for us is to start to integrate ride sharing and transit trip planning. Okay, getting back to this map again, this is the one I showed you a minute ago. An important thing to note here is that there's a lot of information missing here. As useful as this is, there's no stop information and the local transit service is not represented here. This is sort of state of the art a few years ago for us. We are going to be using the GTFS data to begin to really see and understand the overall transit network. And we're doing that in a couple of different ways. Um, this slide talks a little bit about GTFS, general transit feed specification, if you've heard it before. Um, it's, it's great stuff. It really is good. So the different ways that we are going to be using GTFS in the future are things like mapping. Um, we have a prototype map that uh, ODOT GIS department put together. This uses GTFS data to create detailed route maps. So this has long distance transit, local transit, almost the entire transit system in the state. If you zoom down on this map, it also contains stop information. And we can use the stop information not only to understand the network, but to communicate the network to third parties for whom it's not very clear where the transit surface runs in the state. Uh, one example of this within ODOT is we have the highway division that's doing lots of road-related work and maybe building sidewalks or bike paths without a real understanding that there's a unsigned transit stop somewhere in their project. Now, by using this resource, uh, they can begin to factor transit into their project at the beginning, not as an afterthought or just miss it altogether. Um, another way we're leveraging the GTFS data is through a research project with Oregon State University. Um, this is a screenshot of a prototype system that begins to um, uh, use GTFS data to do simple analysis of the network. We expect to be able to do things like um, locate space and time gaps in the network, and that will help us to direct investment and efforts to make the overall network more usable. Again, another screenshot from this Oregon State University effort. Um, you can see a bunch of transit agency there agencies there, one, one of the simple things that this screen functionality do is allow you to view sets of transit service together and understand what routes belong to which systems. A side effect of the OSU project um, is that we expect to be able to provide 
transit data to, to third-party tools like this, Urban Community Explorer, if you play with it, it's a very neat resource for finding all kinds of information about communities across the state. Uh, we expect to provide a fixed route transit information layer as an addition to all these other pieces. So we'll have demographic information, economic information, wide collection information that will now include transit and be a real resource for planning for the state. So the, the bottom line is that, that we've done this investment in, uh, in visibility of the network and usability of the network aimed primarily at the end user. And we've created this side effect of this benefit of GTFS data, which describes the network in great detail and allows us to develop these other tools that help us understand the state of the network and direct our future investments um, in transit around the state. Thanks. Uh, 
um, and uh, places or public health organizations like Kaiser Permanente and, and um, uh, similar groups like that, they're really seeing this as an opportunity to market active transportation as a, as a preventative measure to prevent uh, disease, preventive, preventable diseases like uh, obesity, diabetes, um, and things like that. So in terms of the, um, the there, there is a key framework that, um, that will, um, that can help communities in Oregon better accommodate by bicycling, walking, and transit. Um, I think all of you have heard about the six keys of transit-oriented design or to, uh, transit-oriented communities. So um, uh, communities really need to be dense, diverse in, in the mix of land uses that they have. Um, accessible to de destinations, uh, they need to be designed for people, the streets that, that, that people travel on need to be designed for people first before um, any other type of vehicle. Um, uh, travel distances need to be limited and direct, um, and uh, automobiles need to be, or automobile tra travel needs to be, uh, um, um, or demand, demand needs to be managed um, and those six Ds, or those factors, will um, help build communities that are transit-oriented and enable uh, cycling and walking trips. Um, and a lot of the speakers, a lot of the, um, the three keynote speakers, they kind of hit on these, these trends and these frameworks. Um, and, and it's uh, critical that communities um, build, build into their policies, into their zoning codes, into um, to how they design their streets, um, these, these key factors, and um, transit, access, transit access kind of follows this. So what, is that, what does the 60s, what, what do the 60s mean in uh, different contexts? It's never gonna be a one size uh, fits all type of look or feel, um, and it's never prescriptive. It could look like this, where it's a, uh, a dense transit corridor, it could look, even look like this, where it's a suburban transit node, um, I think this is Gresham. Uh, Gresham. Um, it could even look like this, which is more of a Main Street style um, transit oriented neighborhood. Um, generally speaking, the, the best bicycling cities are also great transit cities. Uh, Portland, Portland, Eugene, Boulder, and Minneapolis are great examples. Um, but the caveat to that is that you have to have a high quality frequent transit that people want to access and use. Um, so if, if, uh, if a city has uh, separated cycle facilities and, um, and uh, uh, ended trip facilities that uh, help people, help support cycling trips, um, the, a missing piece might be if they don't want to use a bike to get to work or a bike to get to their uh, final dest destination, um, they might drive a car because they don't have um, high quality frequent transit service. So why is bicycling important to transit? Bottom line is that uh, it fills seats on transit. Um, it encourages people, uh, or it improves last mile connections and it, uh, alleviates the overcrowding on some highly uh, productive routes. Um, and the previous metric, or one of the previous metrics that uh, transit agencies used to focus on is purely ridership and uh, some of the tools to get that done were building parking rides and uh, the planning extent for, for getting people to access transit stopping stations or just at the stopping station. Now it's more um, oriented towards ridership and access and using more cost effective measures to get people um, into transit vehicles. So bike ride, bike and ride is an example. Jeff can probably provide a little more information on that. Um, uh, helping communities uh, develop more in a more transit-oriented manner um, and focusing on pedestrian and bicycle access improvements um, quarter mile, half mile outside of, of the transit stop and all the long transit corridors. For the user, um, from the user's perspective, it's not really about choosing bikes over transit. It's more about choosing, um, it's about having options. It's about having the flexibility to choose when you want to use transit, when you want to wet bike, or when you want to mix trips. 
um, or mixed uh, types of trips. Um, so transit really helps reduce uh, travel time and distance, uh, bridges network gaps in certain, ca certain cases, and it can act as an insurance um, measure if it's raining or hailing or, or um, if you have a mechanical issue or flat, um, you can use transit to get to your final destination. Um, so there are three primary strategy areas that I'm going to focus on today, um, including uh, infrastructure, access, and programs and marketing. Um, and the, the key is that you, you don't want to focus on any one thing. You want to create, um, uh, you want to uh, implement a, a portfolio of different amenities and, and um, ensure that building, that you're building an integrated network um, with integrated um, support facilities and programs. So I'll go through this pretty fast. Um, so when you're building transit corridors, um, you need to accommodate bicyclists um, and facilitate access into corridors and into transit um, transit centers or, or um, major transit hubs. This is a good example of that. Um, the Rose Corridor Transit Center, um, there is a, the green contraflow, uh, contraflow bike lanes that um, help uh, Cyclists bypass uh, queuing or, or waiting transit vehicles, and it's also they're also supplemented with a green bike box. Uh, just a couple months ago, uh, Portland Bureau of Transportation actually imp implemented a uh, uh, they implemented separated cycle facilities um, that access the transit uh, facility on Multnomah. Um, that's increased. Um, I, don't, I don't have any data, but I would presume that's going to increase comfort and likely um, um, access to the transit station. In addition, you need to, uh, cities and transit agency, agencies need to work together to, to design transit stops so that um, bicyclists and transit vehicles can safely intermix, as well as bicyclists and pedestrians. This is a common um, feature, or this is a popular feature that's being uh, uh, implemented in various cities. Um, including Vancouver and Seattle. Seattle is a good example, but it's right here on Dexter. Um, it's where the passenger waiting area is extended out, out of the, um, um, out beyond the curb line, and there are um, clearly, clearly defined uh, cycling and, and pedestrian mixing zones. Um, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like bike traffic calming, I guess. Um, in addition, um, uh, low-stress bikeways that are par parallel to major transit corridors are critical um, to provide, provide access along the corridor, as well as to provide enhanced bicycle and pedestrian crossings um, at major barriers like uh, like arterial crossings or um, um, at, in, in areas where it would be uh, difficult for or difficult for a cyclist to uh, get across. Uh, the street um, cross bikes are kind of becoming the norm on bicycle boulevards or neighboring greenways, um, and uh, it's it's definitely a challenge to implement those because of uh, restricting access to uh, automobiles. But um, the safety benefits, I think, trump trump the um, circulate the auto circulation uh, impacts. In terms of access, but. Uh, Getting, bicycle, getting more capacity um, for bicycles on transit vehicles is kind of the next step. You typically will see uh, two bicycles on a trans transit vehicle or, or on a transit vehicle. Now you're moving towards uh, vehicles that have two to four uh, or three and four bicycles um, that, are, are, um, that can be accommodated on the front of a bus. Um, in Roaring Fork, they have uh, bike expresses where, where full um, Portions of the transit vehicle are dedicated are dedicated to bicycles. That's kind of a uh, specialized market, but um, it kind of gives you a sense of what's possible. Um, similarly, for some transit services like BRT um, and, and longer haul uh, regional transit trips, um, bicycle storage can be placed on board. Uh, this is an example. Um, in Snohomish County, it's uh, Swift BRT, and I think this is, I think it accommodates four bicycles in this case. Uh, 
Um, in addition, end of trip facilities are definitely a must. Um, uh, with really um, um, full service bike stations that offer secure bike parking, showers, um, lockers, maintenance facilities, or ma maintenance um, um, and retail services, and um, um, similar amenities. They help increase the reliability and security and visibility of, of bicycling and taking long haul bicycle transit trips. Um, similarly, high capacity bicycle parking facilities like Chinese Bike and Ride um, are definitely helpful in um, how transit agencies can expand the reach of, of transit. Bike sharing, we all know about it, it's great, it expand, expands the, um, the reach of transit. That, in terms of marketing and education programs, um, they're kind of an underutilized tool, but they're highly effective, depending on the, depending on the measure that you use or the, the program that you use, they're very effective. Um, so what's the connection between programs and transit? Uh, it's, it's basically to incentivize and enable uh, transit access, and um, programs help to, help to enable transit to work better and also to normalize uh, mode trips. And we kind of mentioned this, or uh, the keynote speakers kind of hinted at this. It's really about creating an active transportation culture. Um, so that, that's the key, that's the key with um, marketing programs is that you, you want to make it a normal part of, of community. You want to make bicycling and walking and using transit just normal. Um, one of the most uh, effective programs is individualized marketing programs. Uh, these essentially use target neighborhoods and um, provide residents and sometimes businesses the tools and, and incentives uh, that help get people walking, bicycling, taking transit trips, and making um, any combination of those types of trips. Um, and some of the tools that you might see are uh, uh, free bike walk maps, uh, community events, um, prizes and, and incentives, and then also educational resources that um, help people uh, um, figure out how, how to, for example, get a bike onto, onto transit or onto a transit vehicle. Uh, this is a specific example of Smart Trips Gateway in Springfield. Um, and this is kind of unique because um, it's based around, it is a targeted neighborhood, but it's actually based around a, a corridor, a transit corridor. So I think that's something that can be utilized um, a little bit more in the future as uh, major transit capital pro um, projects are being uh, built in Portland Metro and other places like Ben who are looking at um, enhanced bus services. Uh, we'll move through this. You guys have probably seen a uh, multimodal trip planning tool, uh, the TriMet trip planning tool. Um, it offers planning support for uh, multiple modes, and it's one of the first that actually um, provides the option of, provide, uh, of getting uh, transit and bicycle trip route planning um, um, support. And to sum this up, um, the keys to integration are to prioritize and invest in um, uh, transit system-wide access, um, and you need to involve um, multiple stakeholders, especially your transit operators. They're a critical component of the design process. Um, going it alone uh, will only yield uh, will only yield um, um, gaps in, in your bicycle transit integration plans. Um, uh, in, in addition, you you need to include support facilities like um, it doesn't have to be the specific ones that we spoke of today, but um, it's important important to provide facilities at the end of trips um, and um, marketing programs as well to ensure that people know what options are out there. Um, and then also, it needs uh, bicycle and trans bicycle, bicycle transit trips need to be um, convenient, flexible, and fun. Um, and in order to do that, you need to look into the three strategy areas that um, I discussed <coughs> earlier. And for those that are in, for those of you that are interested, there's some resources with the Urban Bike Design Guide. There's not a lot on uh, bikeway transit design. Um, I think the next the next iteration of the design guideline will include uh, 
um, that uh, the Urban Street Design Guide is almost complete and it has some, uh, some uh, guidelines on how to deal with uh, transit bicycle interactions, but again, uh, I think we're going to wait for the next iteration of the Bikeway Design Guide to make that, uh, um, uh, to, provide, to provide further guidance. And in addition, TCRP Synthesis 62 has, has a wealth of information that you can use. Um, that, thank you very much. All right, I know everyone's had lunch. We've had snacks. It's 75 degrees outside, so. Um, let me see a show of hands real quick. Uh, how many of you have ever combined a transit trip with a bike trip? All right, that's a good stretch, right? Um, how many of you have ever combined a transit trip with a walking trip? <laughs> All right, so that's the point, that's it. All right. So my name is Jeff Owen, uh, TriMet uh, or uh, the Active Transportation Planner. Um, we are a big agency, of course, as you know, uh, bus, light rail, commuter rail. We are a big region, um, Hillsboro, Forest Grove, Cornelius, all the way to the east, uh, Gresham, et cetera, et cetera, Tiger Tualatin down south to the tip of Wilsonville. Um, so basically, I want to I want to touch on our two main components. I'm going to touch on uh, access to transit via bike first, and then access to transit via walking second. Um, I want to point out really quick, we don't try to hide this stuff. We have very simple URLs in case you forget, backslash bike and backslash walk. Um, you know, it's pretty obvious why we want to focus on access to transit via walking, but uh, just a reminder of why we want to focus on access to transit uh, via biking is because biking really expands the reach of transit. Um, so definitely just want to keep that in your mind as we go through this. Um, I just want to run through the quick options that exist currently for accessing transit via bike. Um, every bus that we have is equipped with uh, at least, uh, sorry, not at least, two bikes per front rack. Uh, we have bike racks at most all of our stations and some bus stops. We have reserved keyed bike lockers that you reserve ahead of time for someone who's a very regular commuter. Uh, with the same pattern over and over, you want that guaranteed space. We also have on-demand lockers. Uh, they're switching over that so that we can use the same amount of real estate and make it available to many more people. And then we have uh, three bike and rides. Uh, so we'll run through some examples of those really quick. Um, loading and unloading, Evan touched on some of the uh, ways to teach people about this. We try to make it pretty simple. Um, it's worth stressing, you know, that, that we don't have time restrictions. The system is, is open to bringing bikes on board, uh, all of our vehicles. Uh, there is capacity restraint but we do allow it system-wide. Uh, we try to make it nice and easy uh, so you know where to go and where to store your bike while you're on board. Um, we have high floor cars, low floor cars, and then Wes at the bottom. And um, So bike racks at almost every station, some bus stops, a variety of racks, some, some are covered, most are uncovered, so we're trying to improve that in the future. Um, again, the reserve lockers, they vary a little bit, but they're, they're, they're definitely there, they're well utilized. Uh, and then we're switching to the on-demand, um, not necessarily switching, but starting to phase in the on-demand bike lockers as well. Um, so the bike and rides are our kind of Cadillac uh, deluxe version. We have three of these now, they're safe and secure. Um, Beaverton, Sunset, and Gresham, and there's definitely, I think, more in the future. So I wanted to kind of jump right into some of these questions. Uh, so as you're sitting there in your mind, think about things you want to discuss here at the end. Uh, will there be more people living in the region? Uh, definitely so, yes. Within biking distance of transit, I believe so. That's kind of the way that our regional policies are set up. Uh, so there will be more bikes on the road. Uh, but will there be more capacity on board buses? And that's really a maybe. Um, you know, we continue to test different models of racks. Uh, but that's a maybe. We don't have that a definite yet. Um, you know, and the tough one, will there be more capacity on board Max and Wes? Um, and, and the answer is, is probably not, and I want you to keep thinking about this, um, but you know, probably not. There's several reasons, but um, you know, it doesn't mean it's ruled out, but I just want to be honest about that. Um, will there be more use of folding bikes? Uh, that's a maybe. You know, I'm a little bit skeptical. 
Some of you might own folding bikes, uh, but they're just not really taking off. Um, there definitely will be more bike parking stations. And, and so that's, that's kind of what we're really invested in, is, is focusing on station modes and combining these two modes. Um, not always bringing your bike on board the vehicle with you, but parking and, and utilizing station bikes. So I want you to keep that in mind and uh, you know, think of some questions for the discussion part coming up next. Um, and I want to switch gears real quick and talk about walking access to transit. Uh, this morning, uh, Mark Gordon you know, had, a great, uh, had a great line where he said, and I didn't plan this out, but it, it fits in really well. It was, uh, birds fly, fish swim, and people walk. Um, you know, so again, when your hands went up earlier, you know, every transit rider is a pedestrian first and probably last. Even if you're just walking to a car and parking ride, uh, you need these facilities. Um, so on the one hand, any, any improvement in the pedestrian realm is a bonus, right? That's a good thing. But the reason we did the pedestrian network analysis is to really help us focus on the areas that would have, uh, that would serve the uh, greatest need, but also with the highest opportunities. Um, and back there in the back corner on the way out, uh, there are some hard copies of the pedestrian network analysis. I'm gonna try to summarize it pretty quickly, uh, which is hard to do, but feel free to grab a hard copy on the way out. Um, so the, again, the importance of this effort was to really help us to focus on our energies and kind of where to work with partners to look for improvements. Uh, prioritizing safety, uh, I believe Ross uh, just a minute will touch on cost-effective uh, service. So the more that we can switch people over to fixed route, the better. Uh, there's definitely times when that's still not going to work, but um, it's really cost-effective to do that. And then it's really uh, creating great places. Uh, walkability has multiple benefits, and it really creates great places. So we have tons of transit stops in the in the region. Um, have over 6,500 stops. Uh, what you see here on the, on the map is clusters. Uh, there are 66 clusters that have, through the methodology of the study, have risen to the top. Uh, this is a, a data-driven analysis. It's not subjective. Um, so these are clusters of stops that come to the surface based on this methodology. Um, I know you can't read probably every word on the screen, but there's a, a, a base layer that took into fact uh, environmental factors um, as well as factors at the transit stop overlaid with um, the deficiencies and opportunities. And then we add those two together, those gave us uh, composite scores. And that's what really led us to these 10 focus areas. Um, so again, this is data driven. Uh, these are areas where we can make a difference and where there's a lot of potential for making a difference. Um, and so these are the 10 focus areas, again, that you can kind of read more about if you want to in the hard copy in the back. It's also online as well. Um, I want to stress that partners are key to everything we do, especially on the pedestrian side. Um, you know, we, we can't do it all. We don't own the stuff. Uh, we don't own the sidewalks. Uh, there's many partners involved. Um, the pedestrian network analysis was uh, an initial effort that is now complete, but uh, we're working really hard to keep it going, keep it alive, and to find funding uh, to build the improvements that the, that the analysis calls for. So I want to go quickly through some uh, success stories. Um, so these are just some samples, just a few. Uh, this is in Aloha, uh, 185th TV Highway. On the left, you see there is a sidewalk, but there's also a lot of dirt. On the right, yeah, this is great. You know, we've built improvements, there's shelters, um, but, you know, there's no people, right? So, thanks to the beauty of Google Maps and Street View, if you go to this intersection and zoom in Street View, you see that people are using this stuff. Uh, so we're really getting uh, usage out of this. We have people crossing the road, uh, coming to the transit stop and using these improved facilities, waiting for the bus. 52 to go north out of uh, Aloha. Uh, in Cornelius, on the left you see mostly kind of a thoroughfare uh, environment. There is the uh, sign there letting you know that that is a crosswalk. But on the right, the after is uh, shortened crossing distance for pedestrians. Uh, we have more signage, have a push button activated um, light overhead. And then again, there's no people, right? So as soon as you look the other way in street map, you're looking back at this intersection. You got people in the crosswalk, you got the cars that are obeying their stop line. Um, so this is really creating a greater place. Uh, we have people also waiting for the uh, bus uh, that's on the left side back there. So one last example, uh, Hillsboro. Um, on the left, you know, there are multiple reasons why this is not good. On the right, uh, you see the, the after version there, sidewalk, shelter, safer environment, uh, providing that access to the stop. 
Um, and then, you know, again, thanks to the beauty of uh, street, uh, street View and Google Maps, people are actually using this stuff. I didn't plan this to happen. It's just, you know, when the funny car comes driving by with the camera on top, this is, this is what it captures. Um, one last thing I want to plug for partner success stories is uh, a partnership we've had with the city of Portland to install rectangular rapid flashing beacons. These are just a couple locations listed on the left uh, with two example photos on the right, but there are many more of these to come. Uh, so this is not, again, this wasn't an effort that was just stuck in time. This is something we're continuing to do, make progress on. Uh, I wanted to give you just a quick reminder again, this isn't a, a dead document. We are, we are really keeping this alive. This morning, if you attended the funding session, um, you heard mention of the STIP enhanced process. So this is just a reminder that we are, we are working with our partners to identify areas where we really think there can be great returns on investments for pedestrian access to transit. So these are just four corridors that are still in the mix for Region 1, uh, ODOT STIP Enhance. And uh, you know, just for these four corridors, our, our partners are ODOT, Washington County, uh, Portland Gresham, Tiger Dan Tualatin. So just a snapshot here. Um, so just want to be honest and say that you know, we have had successes, uh, but there's a ton more to do. There's at least 1,500 stops in our system that still don't have uh, complete uh, sidewalk access. So there's, there's a lot to do. So again, kind of what's the future? Uh, we're definitely going to have more people living in the region. Uh, due to our policies, again, in the region, they're, they're going to be near, near transit. They're going to be able to walk there. Um, you know, many sessions already today have touched on aging. And, and uh, yes, we're going we're to be aging as a population. Um, you know, and I hope that there's going to be more money for sidewalks and crossings, but that's not a guarantee. It's something we still need to work for and prioritize. Um, and you know, can TriMet build it all? And the simple answer is no. We really rely on partners. Um, again, we don't own uh, every bit of the things that we, that we need to do to implement a safe environment and a great place to access transit. So partnerships are key for us. Um, you know, here are just a few more questions. Uh, Will there be more local and regional leaders who, who prioritize this stuff? And you know, it, it kind of depends, right? Some of you are thinking maybe yes, and some probably you know, you're thinking of maybe a failure or a success. So there's, it's, it's, it's hopefully, but uh, that's a reality. We don't know that for sure. Um, you know, and then again, the tough questions uh, we're dealing with, with still deciding between prioritizing throughput and prioritizing short and safe crossings of little communities. Um, so again, keep, keep some more of these questions in mind for yourself and, and uh, can bleed over to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Resources for seniors, people with disabilities, people with low incomes. Um, we're gap fillers. We fill lots of gaps. And, and um, as great as our system is, it still has gaps. Um, I also want to thank the, o the OATS, the organizers of this conference. Um, Ride Connection hasn't been a big participant in the active transportation conversation. Um, and I'm going to present some information today that will sort of help. Um, solidify the role that, that our organization can play in this kind of conversation. And you know, I think we've heard a lot about health, we've heard a lot about seniors during today's conference. Um, so that's kind of the niche that, that Ride Connection can really help fill. So, um, when Aaron originally asked me to present, he asked me to present uh, based on some, some data that I was talking about in Washington, D.C. at the Transportation Research Board, I made a poster um, that looked at the changing demographics of our cities. The question I was asking is, how has the concentration of seniors and people with low incomes changed over the last 10 years? Um, earlier in Evan's presentation, he talked about how more people are moving into the cities. And I want to I want to add a caveat to that, because when you look at the data, more people are moving into the cities when they can afford it. Um, but I want to find out a little bit more about the sort of equity side of that equation. What's, what's happening 
at a broad scale for uh, seniors and people with low incomes. When I did the analysis, that was the only data that was available for the 2010 census. And I recently um, downloaded the statistics for equity and finished the analysis during lunch. So I'm going to share those with you as well. Or sorry, not for equity, but for minorities. Um, what I did was I looked at four cities. I looked at Portland, Charlotte, North Carolina, Dallas, Texas, and Salt Lake City. All of these cities have been growing cities over the last decade. All of these cities have transit systems. All of these cities are doing innovative things when it comes to transportation planning and infrastructure. And um, all of these cities are different from one another in terms of their socio-political sort of contexts. But what's not unique about them is they all basically have the same trends happening. I'm going to zoom in on Portland and then I'll show you the other cities as well. I have to explain some of the statistics I was using because some of this might not be um, germane. On the top, I measured distance from the central business district. So I basically found the densest part of the city, put a point there, and then measured out. So in Portland, um, measuring out from the downtown area six miles gets you to about the Gateway District. Measuring out to about 12 miles gets you out to about right before you get to downtown Gresham. So you can see my measurements along the top. And then over on the left, I have age and income. I used the ratio of the in income to the poverty level. So anything below one means that you make less than the poverty level. And, and two is usually the mark for a lot of social service programs. You've probably heard like 200% of the poverty level. That means you make twice the poverty level, which is actually still not very much money. Um, so anything above two, I've kind of called affluent. And if you look at the trends here, the concentration, oh, and, and one more statistic to, to kind of clarify. I used a location quotient, which is kind of a concentration measure, looking at the relative concentration of a population of one group compared to the entire population within that sub-area. Okay, so now looking at the percent change between these different zones, low-income individuals living within one mile of the central business district became 14 and 12 percent less concentrated in a 10-year period. And then you look out to 6 to 12 miles away from the central business district, they became somewhere between 5 and 10 percent more concentrated. Now, I mentioned that the other four cities had similar patterns. Double those numbers for the other cities. In Charlotte, it was a 30% drop in the concentration of people low incomes in the central city and a 30% increase in the suburbs. So that is an interesting statistic. Now, we've seen a lot of these density maps showing the density of things like active transportation infrastructure. Well, here's the density in terms of concentration of individuals who are both low income and senior in 2000 and 2010. I'm going to talk loud so you can hear me while I walk over here. But it's, it's hard to see, but right around the edges, you get these darker colors, right? Now, what's interesting about that is that it's the opposite for the concentration of the kind of infrastructure that we're talking about at this conference. So this is really important for transportation planners to wrap our heads around, because the infrastructure in these neighborhoods, where a lot of seniors and low-income populations are being pushed to, isn't adequate to serve their needs. There's a major equity issue. I think all of us sort of get that. Um, I haven't been able to find any pu published data on this. Uh, that was why I wrote this paper. Any other researchers in the room that want to collaborate on expanding this and growing it, come talk to me afterwards, because we've got some ideas about doing that. But um, it raises an important question. Knowing this, how do we maximize mobility for non-drivers? I, when I use the term non-drivers, I'm talking about seniors, people with disabilities, people with low incomes. Now, while you ponder that question, I want to tell you a little bit about Ride Connection. Before I mentioned it, how many people here, here had heard of Ride Connection? This is, that's great. That's fantastic. So we're a nonprofit. Our mission is to link accessible, responsive transportation with community needs. We were formed about 25 years ago when um, TriMet realized that its demand-responsive uh, paratransit program could not sustainably meet the demand. As soon as it was being offered, it became enormously popular. Lots of people wanted to use it, and it was very expensive to provide. So TriMet started looking for alternatives. And we, at the time, I was like not very old at the time, so I shouldn't say we, I wasn't involved at all. The, the folks who were involved 
uh, looked around the community and realized there were a dozen nonprofits and social service agencies based in neighborhoods that were serving these populations. Some of them had transportation programs. So what, what TriMet did at the time was put together a nonprofit that could strengthen and support what those organizations do. A lot of it focused on volunteer drivers and training volunteers, providing insurance, making sure that all of the infrastructure was there so that rather than um, cutting paratransit service, we were able to increase an alternative that was lower cost, higher quality, and attract demand that direction. So it became a win-win. Since then, we've added a lot of programs. You probably can't read that. Our website is rightconnection.org. You can go there and read more about us. Um, this is a list of all the things we do. Over time, we've just been adding different programs to the mix. When Aaron asked me to present, I thought, you know, the, the one program that we have that really does link us to active transportation is our RideWise travel training program. So I want to tell you a little bit about that. This is Mike Mullins. He's our mobility manager. And what his job is, is to train individuals who are interested and willing to learn how to use the fixed route. They may be eligible to use the paratransit service. Paratransit is the ADA mandated uh, community curb to curb service. What does that say, four minutes? Four. Okay, that um, TriMets provides. It costs 35 bucks a trip. Um, if we can train individuals to use it, it's a win-win. Last year we trained 230 individuals to ride independently. We published a book with TriMet a few years ago called The Rider's Voice. I've taken three pictures here of, of the many individuals that we've uh, trained to travel independently. And the outcomes of the program are phenomenal. The folks that you're looking at here have had profound impacts to their lives. Uh, Mark Gordon talked this morning about the importance of independent mobility. Well, this program is an investment in independent mobility. We keep people out of nursing homes. We keep people out of jail. We get people to college. And we, we facilitate a lot of amazing outcomes that are incredibly important for our communities. And consequently, we save a lot of money. This is not a cost center. This is a profit center for our communities. We saved TriMet after cost nearly a million dollars last year. And that does not account for the compounding effects year over year. We've been doing this for nine years. You guys do the math. It's an exponential curve and it saves taxpayers. It saves all of us a lot of money. And the way that's connected to active transportation is it means TriMet's able to keep more buses on the street. Now, I was curious. I wanted to know, does active transportation infrastructure have any relationship to the incoming ridewise requests we get? Because the, the benefits that we can spin off of the program depend on how many people are coming into it. So I thought, well, there must be neighborhoods that don't have sidewalks where people who could use the RideWise program aren't, right? That, that, that was the question I had. So I looked into it, and it turns out there's almost no correlation between sidewalk infrastructure and RideWise requests. Here's your sidewalk infrastructure map. How many minutes? Two. The red dots are RideWise requests. I did a regression analysis. There's very little correlation. I talked to our mobility manager and he said, yeah, you know, I don't hear that often that a bad sidewalk is, the, is, is a barrier to folks who want to learn to ride the bus and then to use the bus. And that kind of boggled my mind. I thought, well, wait, I'm going to the Oats conference. They're going to want to hear that um, my data supports more infrastructure. And now they're going to think I'm a blaspheme if I come and say that uh, the data actually says that the sidewalks aren't as critical as we thought. And so I'm not here to say that sidewalks shouldn't be a priority. I think they should be. They definitely help when they're there. The point that we took away from this was this. Okay, now go back to those original statistics that I showed you. Our riders are getting pushed out. They're not getting pushed out two or three miles. They're getting pushed out six to 12 miles. And the distances for their trips to get to school, to get to work, to get to the community services, programs that they go to are so long they would never make that trip walking anyway. Without the bus, without that critical connection, our services are meaningless. So I want to leave you with a few takeaways. One, our cities are becoming different from what they were. We have some major demographic shifts going on. I like to think of it as like um, large-scale 
gentrification. It's the opposite of what happened in the 60s and 70s with white flight. Community-based programs that coordinate services can help. Ride Connection's an example of this. And in particular, programs like RideWise can make the system more efficient. But the takeaway that I want to leave with you guys, and, and really kind of the critical thing that I think active transportation planners need to, need to keep in mind, is that the bus is fundamental. Without it, we can't make those connections. I'll leave my contact information up here. I appreciate your time. Thank you. She said, oh, because of your system, I have one third more disposable income than I would without it. A third. <laughs> That's not a couple bucks. And maybe for her, you know, at $10 an hour, that was $100 more. But that's $100 that didn't go into gas, tires, and mechanics. That's $100 that went back into her rural community and made her, gave her a higher quality of life. Not just that she wasn't driving every day, but that she was having uh, the ability to make discretionary decisions. So each of the systems really is a, a jewel and provides services that aren't available some other place. These aren't writers of choice, generally. But uh, when you're looking at long distances for any type of travel, 60-mile, uh, one-way job uh, trips, that's expensive. So looking for ways that people in rural communities don't have to move every time their jobs change and that you can create some continuity and infrastructure in the community. Uh, so that's sort of the basic community layer. With, it has some regional interconnectivity, mainly local, um, local trips. The county systems go throughout the county. Uh, we have inner city operators. So uh, Oregon has a wonderful interconnected system that connects those communities and gives people access to rail and bus uh, as well. The Greyhound comes up through here, connects to the rail up here in the Tri-Cities, so you can go into Portland by rail that way. Uh, you are able to capture the Greyhound along this route. They have feeder services. Uh, Enterprise, Joseph, comes in. And they make, that only comes in three times a week, but it uh, comes in at times when they can catch the bus. So, Really, the concept here that I'm trying to talk about is that 
There is a network out there, and it's a network that we have in Oregon invested in uh, access and interconnectivity, so that it's, it's a piece of infrastructure, it's a tool. And this is sort of a, not, a, not as great an analysis as Ross just did, but uh, oops. Uh, here you can see the poverty rate in the area is pretty uh, significant. But the non-SOV travel rate is also significant. So people out here in rural areas are not just driving their cars around. They're riding their bikes, they're walking, there's a very small piece of it that's transit, but mainly this is carpooling. Um, the car, you can see the carpool rates are pretty significant in these areas. Uh, and I, I did this by adding together the commute to work, the journey to work information, because I feel like we get into sort of modalism. And really, what we're talking about here is non-SOV. Anything non-SOV, good. SOV, not so good. Um, it just uses up a lot of resources, takes a lot of time, sucks a lot of energy out of the community. So what we're looking at is how do we, how do I as a person that works at ODOT and in communities for community development, support what people are already doing? I'm not, I don't need to build a new system and have people come to it. I'm looking at how can I support seniors, which we have hmm, significant population, people in poverty, we have a lot of that too. Um, how do I help them get where they need to go and be engaged in their community and do that as just a part of their life? And that's something special. So this is, this is the northern part. So you can see the Union Baker Wallawa. In the south, you can see that uh, we, all, we have a lot of the same issues, but a lot less people. 46,000 people in those three counties. <laughs> Uh, I put in the most populated city because I thought, you know, that's, that gives you a sense of how big out there. Um, I didn't put the square miles, and that, that would give you another sense of big dispersion. Uh, but you can still see that the non-SOV rate is huge. It just blew me away when I looked at this because it really made me feel like what I'm doing is supporting what people are doing in their communities. I'm not trying to get them to do something different. I'm there to support them. So, given that, um, what do we do? Well, again, you can't do everything alone. And my latest thing is I ended up connected with the Scenic Bikeway Group. What is someone who's doing transportation for people who are senior and disabled and low income, what are they doing at a Scenic Bikeway meeting? Well, I like to ride. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I went to it and it was great. And there was like 70 people in the Grand from the mayor to business people to hoteliers to the banking, you know, banking manager, bakery. I mean, we had people at that meeting. And Nita, I think she, oh, she's here. She's the leader of the charge, leader of the pack. And I was, I was so happy. Yeah, she's the, did the scenic bikeway for the Grand Tour. Thank you, Anita. There were three people from ODOT there. I had found out from our bike pet, our, our safety coordinator, and then the maintenance manager who manages the area's roads and then had the signs all put up, he was there. And it turns out you've got all these like hidden riders all over in ODOT, which is great because it gives them an eye to the road in a really very fundamental way that's um, something we can capitalize on. So anyway, it made me think about uh, the the scenic bikeways as a group of people who are really engaged in transportation in my community. And how can I capitalize on that? That's one of my favorite things. Um, so the first thing I thought of was, my gosh, let's see. I know there's a park and ride in there. Uh, so uh, North Powder, here's La Grande, here's Baker City. The, the ride for the Grand Tour sort of comes through, like, through here. Yeah, it cuts them through here. So it's a pretty central place that's already a transit stop. It's the turnoff to Anthony Lakes. Uh, Anthony Lakes is all signed up on Drive Less Connect. They did um, radio spots all this winter to um, advertise Drive Less Connect. Uh, so there's a carpool, a ski, you know, stop-off point. Oh, and it's a point on the Grand Tour. 
So we're looking at doing kiosks like this at that park and ride that'll give information about the Grand Tour, about the transit, um, about catching, you know, catching the bus there, carpooling. So really the issue is um, trying to bring all those pieces together and be visible in the community. And those are the partnerships that allow us to do that. So I'm very excited about um, getting this done. We're working on this. ODOT is like, the permit person is gonna go do the Fondo in Baker City with me. We're just like, we're gonna have fun and we're gonna create these really nice nodes and spots that are really visible in this community and I think engage new partnerships and new people, you know, to help build and envision uh, this in this very rural, somewhat isolated area. We're close to wilderness. So what's next? Well, I thought everyone would like to see this. The, this, oh, bikes on the new train. We've doubled the capacity on the Talgo. So we have so many options. And I was looking at the bike, scenic bikeways map, and there's a bunch of places where those scenic bikeways intersect with our inner city transportation and our transit. So when you're thinking about doing your next trip, don't think first about not driving to the start. Think about what you can do to have your carless vacation and really utilize the infrastructure and the network we have. Uh, the results, we're gonna have more bikes on buses. Matthew's program, my program, we're working at making sure that all the bikes, all, all the buses that we purchase in the area have bike racks. And even if they don't have racks, if they have policies about putting the bikes on board because it's very important to have that background. Okay, okay. Um, the, we want to have, well, we need to be participating in and um, connecting with a bunch of different pieces. The Drive Less Connect, the bikeways, transportation options for the park and rides, um, transit, the inner city, um, and tourism. But the thing we learned yesterday at the Scenic Bikeways meeting is the TSPs. And I, we haven't really talked about it that much here. I haven't heard people talking about it. But the transportation system plans are where you create the coat rack that you can hang all these transit jewels. And for people in rural communities or smaller towns, don't assume that the problem that you're running into is that people don't want something. If it's not in that plan, we won't fund it and we won't build it. So it's important for these plans to get integrated and um, amended into your TSPs. Also, the data that my, uh, Matthew was talking about, that goes into modeling. And we have some of the best modeling in the country, the most comprehensive, and so that information about transit goes right in there and can be used to look at how, reflect back with numbers what's going on in our cities. So I think that we need to imagine our future and then we need to do it. And I look forward to working with you and making that happen. Thanks all. Um, we have about 15 minutes left for questions, and uh, I, I, I expect that some of our speakers may hang around afterwards so we could uh, entertain more questions. Raise your hand if you have a question, if you want to ask the first one. Yeah. the analysis that was included in my paper, uh, which I can send to you, it, it isn't published, um, but I also looked at the investments in transit infrastructure in the same 10-year period, and in all of these cities, the, in, the investments in capital, uh, 
projects um, increased by you know double digit percentages while the investments in uh, suburban bus services stayed flat or declined. And I think that um, the critical issue, I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, transportation policy and funding, and the, the biggest issue is buses are an operating cost. They're an ongoing operating cost that's um, large. It's a large investment, and we're not making, I, I, this is sort of my personal opinion, but we're not making a big enough investment in suburban bus um, service. And until we do, um, we won't be maximizing mobility for non-drivers. Um, um, unless, you know, I kind of think of it as it's a, it's a land use issue, it's a housing issue, and it's a transportation issue. But, you know, the neighborhoods that are walkable where you don't have to provide as much bus service are incredibly expensive. Um, so if we can't do something on the housing end, we've got to do something on the transportation end. Other folks might have an opinion, but it's a hard problem. It's, it's going to require some serious advocacy and lobbying. And numbers. And numbers. And data, good data. I, well, the other thing I want to say about that though is um, the, the things that are driving the federal debt are largely Medicaid and Medicare. Um, this, this was brought up earlier in some of the conversations we've had. Most of our customers are on one of those programs, either Medicaid or Medicare. And it's one of those kind of public problems that um, stays true to the Pareto principle, where 80% of your costs come from 20% of your members. Now, we're working with coordinated care organizations in Oregon to look at, can we do things from a transportation standpoint to help you with that 80% cost by transporting those members and maybe even providing more transportation than would, would make sense to get them to preventive care, to make sure that uh, they have high quality transportation when they're coming off dialysis so that they don't have complications afterwards. So there's, you know, we need to start looking at things like that as well. Other questions? I apologize because this is a little less of a question and more of a follow on comment on that. Um, if you're thinking about uh, how to do things like provide that, that additional bus service in, in the suburban area that needs it, that deserves it, where people really do need it, but the sidewalks aren't there, the places aren't there, so the mix of uses aren't yeah. there, um, that's why people are moving there, because it's not attractive, there aren't as many people, and there's less demand, which makes the, the service less cost effective which means more resources. I'd make a plea, you know, in, in the Portland region, I'm with TriMet, uh, in Eugene, in other places, I swear to you, the planners want to put more service on the street. We know the public wants to put more service on the street. We're working with the pub, with stakeholders, um, jurisdictions on service enhancement plans to create that vision for what the bus service should look like. The people who need to hear that are the folks who have the purse strings and make the decisions about where fu funding goes. And our particular issue is that we need help figuring out our cost structure so we can spend the money on bus service, not on health care, um, especially for our retirees. But it's think about where that advocacy need, needs to go and think about how you can help make that happen would be my plea. Um, great, great stuff, though. We really want to follow up with you on understanding that. Well, I have a question. Um, I, you you already described, uh, I think all the panels described some of this, but how do you um, measure access and mobility overall in terms of, Evan, you talked about how uh, transit agencies are moving from just looking at, well, we want to provide a lot of rider trips. Our measure of performance is we transport this many passengers. Um, but, but what are some other kinds of performance indicators that look at the multimodal network instead of just networks individually? It's a very broad question. Yeah, yeah. I think back at the, the um, park and ride uh, issue, it's, it costs up to $80,000 at the parking spot. Um, that is not cost effective, and um, in terms of getting the number of 
people, a, a larger number of people to stations or, or um, transit centers, um, you can provide more access by um, um, by um, investing in things like bike rides, where you can fit more bikes into a more compact space and spend less money on um, on um, access than on a parking ride, for example. And uh, maybe just one other note on that would be to, you know, we, we have good ridership data. You know, transit agencies usually have good ridership data. Um, and cases where places like Metro are organizing regional counts of trails, uh, counting bicyclists and pedestrians, and really starting to do more of that and match those two together to look for you know, where there's a crossing, where there's potential for more demand, uh, switching from a certain you know, bikeway that might be north-south to a transit service that's east-west, et cetera. Um, so perhaps there's you know, more energy as time goes by, and there's a volunteer-based system now for trail counts. Uh, I think that uh, that was plugged earlier today, but that's definitely a way that, that people can get involved and help out and actually create that data. Jeff, maybe a better and more specific question I could ask here is, Will the bike share system in Portland change the way TriMet plans its transit network and thinks about it? Uh, that's a great question. I think there's still a lot to be you know, determined about where, <clears throat> where the stations will be, um, how that's going to operate. But I, I really choose to, to make sure to look at it as a positive um, in the sense that you know, we have bike and rides that are uh, outside of the core of the city. PSU and the city, and there's other entities that do bike parking in the city, and we have some as well. But bike share, when it comes online, will really be a good complement to everything we've done at stations all across the region, uh, whether it's bike and rides or just bike lockers. So I really see that being complementary. Um, as for how that will change, I think it will change some people's travel patterns, but again, I think that for many factors, um, you know, not everyone is automatically going to stop riding transit once they get into the bike share area and switch. They're really going to be complementary and work together uh, to provide a, you know, even more um, reasoning that you can live a low car lifestyle. So I really see it as being complementary. Another question related to the bikes. You said um, you guys have been taking uh, counts of bikes and pedestrians, and I noticed um, when we crossed the Hawthorne Bridge going west, they have that counter now for bikes and pedestrians. Is that a TriMet um, station? And then are there more around or more planned? No, uh, that's actually a, that's a, a PBOT, I guess, owned and maintained. And as my understanding, someone in the room might be able to correct me, that was funded as a gift by Cycle Oregon. Uh, right, I'm seeing some head shaking, so I think that's correct. Uh, so that's actually a very unique situation. Um, you know, that's the only one we have like that in the city. And I can't speak to whether or not there's more in the way. I definitely hope the future brings more of those, but they're expensive. Um, on, on TriMet's side, we haven't done actual counts of uh, how, many, how many bikes go on board the system in quite a while. We have a, a survey that was done in 07, 08. And so definitely one of my hopes would be to do that soon in the future. I can't promise when, but hopefully soon. Um, the counts I was referring to mostly were uh, organized through Metro and the Intertwine Alliance. And that's where they're really working with jurisdictions who each have kind of a lead in, in, in giving more data uh, to the national, even on the national stage. So, you know, hopefully just several of these efforts can kind of mesh together. And, you know, we take the cycle counts from the, Hawthorne, uh, from the Hawthorne Bridge counter that's online, it's easily accessible. You can watch it go up and down with seasonality and data week and month. Uh, you know, take all of these data points and really feed them together and make them mesh. Uh, I think that'll really be a step towards having a better understanding of of how we're moving on I don't think I need the mic. Okay. Yeah. About an hour ago, some of us tried to use uh, Google Transit to uh, find out what it would say about getting from Salem to Portland, but it totally ignored Amtrak and provided a very circuitous route to get up to Portland. So that's, that's a very good uh, observation. I'll make a quick note and hand it off to Matthew. Um, I've also done a lot of trip planning like that myself between the two. Um, my previous position was with Smart, uh, based out of Wilsonville. And so the way that you know Google Maps oftentimes uh, gives you, you plan a trip from A to B and you specify your time, and it gives you just the first couple of suggestions. So if you change that by five minutes arriving or leaving, 
uh, it gives you different answers. So sometimes it does pull in, um, you know, it'll pull in one bus route and not the other, or from one agency and not the other, but it gives you what you think you want. Uh, it's definitely uh, progressing, getting better all the time, but I'm presuming Matthew might have a little more say. Yeah, you bring up a really good point. Um, there are a lot of flaws in Google Transit with respect to longer statewide trips. Um, my sense is the application was developed with an urban environment, single transit system in mind, and some of the choices about what to present to you don't make as much sense as they should when you're making longer trips. In addition to sensitivity to time, there's also a big sensitivity to your origin, location, and your destination. So you may find that if you are, are have a starting destination that's a mile or not that far from an Amtrak station, you may get a similar um, roundabout option, even if you're making a relatively long trip on Amtrak. So the, the algorithm around how to weigh walking against um, the convenience you want of having a, a, a fast, long-distance trip isn't quite right now with, with Google. And they are making progress, but uh, they have a lot of work to do. Sorry, just one last note. Uh, there's also a way that when you're planning your trip, you can right-click either on the screen or in the top right corner, and you can suggest to Google that something didn't make sense or that they're leaving out a certain service. So you can send that to them. They log in their system. And they actually give you an email back that says um, you know, something like the Google team either approves you or they're looking into it. So um, I've had some success with actually getting service added to their their radar screen by suggesting that. So it's a good point. Are there other questions? I want to ask one more question to, to Matthew. Um, do you have any information about uh, bike tourists using the intercity transit network. Uh, is it useful for tourists? Um, we, we don't have a breakout of um, bikes on buses uh, by purpose. We do track the number of cyclists uh, taking the intercity routes that we have a contract for. So that's a subset of the intercity service for which we have uh, counts on bikes that are taken on the Well, as, a, as someone who's uh, used inner city services and uh, done bike tours, it's useful as a tourist to have that other way of the network. Um, well, people can stay longer if you want to ask additional questions, but we are at the end of the session. So uh, thank you all for coming and asking good questions. Thank you.